Women Plus Plus is a Swiss nonprofit organization with the mission to increase diversity in the Swiss tech industry. Our core values of leadership, education, inclusion, and collaboration guide the design of every Women Plus Plus initiative. And that's also why I'm such a huge fan of everything that uh, was done and that will be done in the future. And also, of course, what happens today. We have around 80% female participation ratio in our programs, which is achieved by implementing women-friendly tech programs designed to attract women to the tech industry, support their transition into tech, and to facilitate female leadership in the tech sector. Building on Women++ Plus Plus learnings from previous events, Deploy Impact is designed to maximize impact by focusing on applied learning, collaboration, and connecting the community with companies that support diversity in tech. The format is a remote, hands-on software development program for social good. So who takes part in Deploy Impact? Uh, the protagonists are NGOs, participants, and mentors. More than ever, NGOs are in need of tech solutions to advance their missions because they bring real challenges for participants, challenges that can help directly advance their social cause. And let me tell you one super sought, of, sought after skill today is the, to solve complex problems. <laughs> so challenges are actually a welcome thing in a certain sense. Around 30 participants with different backgrounds will be the key to building successful solutions to advance social good. And the sponsoring companies will bring in their know-how to help project teams develop extraordinary solutions while honing their skills. They will facilitate preparatory workshops, such as today, and offer mentorships support during the program. This year, with Deploy Impact, you can make a difference. So develop software solutions for one of these two social causes. First, with the InZone project, powered by the University of Geneva, you will develop software that enables students in refugee camps to access higher education. And second, with Kona Connect's project, you can help marginalized communities access legal aid worldwide. Two very important topics. In this program, you'll work with a dynamic interdisciplinary team for a duration of six weeks from October 16th till November 27th. And participants will collaborate in a digital platform remotely and investing around 10 dedicated hours per week with a flexible schedule, as is the norm today. <laughs> and the main roles in each team are as follows. Software developer, tech project manager, UX UI designer, and AI specialist. And right now we are in the last week of the selection process, so make sure you apply soon and Luisa will share the link in the chat. Finally, what are the, the benefits of taking part in Deploy Impact? Biggest difference, uh, the biggest um, uh, benefit is that you can make a difference. And I think this is something we're all longing for, making an impactful change, uh, which is to develop software solutions, which can be implemented in nonprofits with global reach and demonstrable social impact. You get hands-on experience by contributing your skills to a product's end-to-end -end development. Of course, mentorship and work opportunities are a huge benefit. You can create new connections with other tech professionals and maybe find your next dream job. Networking is also essential, crucial. You can expand your network and leverage your freshly sharpened skills with abundant opportunities to meet fellow bright minds with common goals. And last but not least, you can win a prize because the most successful solution for each tech project will win a prize. Now, I would like to introduce to you the Thomson Reuters Labs team facilitating today's webinar. Andrea, Umi, Nadia, and Danilo work at Thomson Reuters Lab, which is the dedicated applied research division of Thomson Reuters. They're focused on the research, development, and application of AI and emerging trends and technologies. Working collaboratively with their stakeholders, they experiment, prototype, test, and deliver ideas in the pursuit of smarter and more valuable tools for their customers. On that note, Danilo and team, thank you so much for joining us today. Please feel free to get started. Thank you, Eva.
Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining this presentation. Um, we'll be sharing some of our experiences working within a diverse team and tell you, telling you about what is keeping us busy and interested at working in technology. Hopefully, you will find this presentation inspirational as well as informational. You see the topics uh, we will be covering within the next roughly 45 minutes. We will have some time at the end of the presentations for you to ask questions. Please hold off with, with questions till the end so that all of us will have a chance to present the topics we prepared. So uh, first of all, my name is Danilo Tomazina. I lead engineers in Europe within Thomson Reuters Labs. Um, it's more than 20 years I'm working in the software engineering field and over the years from studies or work, I've been part of a work env environment with mainly male presence. Luckily, in the last few years, we have been seeing some change. Now, while the overall and unbalanced gender distribution in technology is still reality, I'm happy to see that the needle is moving and we see significant more female applicants when we open, when we open up roles in technology compared to only 10 years ago. But let me do a step back first and diversity. Why diversity? I mean, I'll take a somewhat different approach than what others do uh, to, to, to go on, on, on this topic. So I'm part of a team that deals with the artificial intelligence. We are hungry for data and data is the core of what we do. So what? Well, data tells us that diversity matters. There are many studies that, demonstrates, that demonstrate how diversity positively, positively impacts the workplace environment. And especially within this audience, I, I don't think I need to go into any details. This is part of the data I'm referring to. However, relying on external studies is nice and good, but there is nothing more convincing than experience, experiencing things ourselves. Now, the data I'm talking about is more of subjective nature. I will not show you charts and tables. There are enough, enough uh, out there, and I won't Google it for you. The data I rely on comes from first-person experience. I enjoy the advantages of being part of a diverse workplace environment every day. I see how diversity in genders, origins, culture, age, mentality, and skill backgrounds benefit our results and the day we work. The advantages I see come from corridor discussions, meetings and video calls where people speak up and discuss topics, bringing, bringing different viewpoints. Of course, we are part of a commercial organization and we need to deliver, not discuss forever. But I tell you that once you start opening up your horizon and recognizing how limited your own views are, then this is the point you realize how little you know and how much better you can get, both in your work or in general as a person. And I'm proud to be part of a team that helps me grow and expand my horizon. Now let's look at something else. This sense of belonging and how it can influence diversity. The need to belong is a human emotional need. It is in our nature to look for likely-minded people which share common goals and interests. Various studies show positive links between the sense of belonging and overall well-being. In short, the majority of us, when we belong and feel accepted within a group, we feel well. We might still like our individualism, but also we like, and we like it a lot, to be part of a group. This is one of these fundamental behaviors that have developed during human evolution. A single, a single individual has a much harder time at surviving alone than when being part of a group. However, this need to belong can drive us into taking shortcuts and stick to obvious groups based on gender, nationality, religion. You know, we, we probably all play some boys versus girls games in the past, or maybe still today. Fact is that it, it is unavoidable to be part of some of these obvious groups. But this doesn't mean that we cannot be part of multiple groups or even 
worse that being part of one group means discriminating or even hating other people from other groups. This goes into the topics of diversity and inclusion and inclusion and again there is a lot of training material to learn more about this. However, where I'm adding to is the fact that we can define new groups and values for a group. If we want to achieve more diversity, let's, de let's define and shape groups that embrace diversity as their DNA. Once people will feel proud to be part of such a group, they will attract more likely-minded individuals. The need to belong will reinforce the feeling and will even drive change in those individuals that are unconscious of their group biases or even resistant to change in their attitude and, be and behavior. While you will feel, again, you will find tons of trainings out there helping with achieving more diversity in the workplace. But I think that everybody of us can play a role in this change by pulling some levers in the right places. By creating an environment where people value diversity as their natural and obvious way of being part of the group, we can leverage the human's need to belong to achieve more diversity. Thanks for listening. I'd like now to let Nadia, Urmi and Andrea talk about their experiences and careers in technology and introduce some important topics in the area of artificial intelligence, software engineering and automation. Over to you, Nadia, and please just tell me when I need to move on the uh -huh. slides. Good. Thank you very much, Danila. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining today. I'm Nadia. I am a senior data scientist, part of the labs uh, based in Zug, like most others here on this call. Um, and if you can move to the next slide, um, essentially what I'm doing in this very first part of my short presentation is that I'm going to talk about my transition from academia into industry. And along the way, I'll share some information about my background that I think is still relevant to the work I'm doing now as a senior data scientist. So essentially, my academic journey started with bachelor's and master's in environmental sciences at ETH Zurich. Um, and this is also where I gained my very first experience with coding. So I, I, and there I learned MATLAB and R. And I decided to specialize in the field of climate science. First of all, of course, due to its importance, it's really important nowadays to be aware of climate science and, and know how you can, you can have an impact. But also because I knew that there is a vast amount of data available through the massive climate models that are out there. So through that, I was able to get first experience with data analysis. I published my first academic publications. And because I enjoyed my master thesis abroad so much, I decided that I really want to stay in academia and pursue a PhD. And this is what I did. So I, I moved to Australia for my PhD. And there the topic was um, I wanted to learn about ways to combine different climate models with various statistical approaches to kind of account for their interdependency and avoid biasing the results. And this is also where I started coding in Python. Python is still the language I use most of the days in my current role. And I continued attending international conferences and gained first-hand experience with machine learning. So as you realize, machine learning came in relatively late for me. I didn't learn it at ETH in, during my bachelor's and master's. And I also learned quite important lessons in terms of project management and working across various time zones, which of course nowadays is a really useful skill to have. Um, and then I started realizing towards the end of my PhD that I'm way more interested in the data analysis aspect rather than like the physical and chemical aspects of the climate and weather system. And so I, I knew I didn't have to restrict myself to the climate domain. And I decided to move back to Switzerland and find a data science job in industry. Um, interestingly, what I want to mention here is that I have never experienced being a minority as a female in technology throughout my whole academic career. And so there was always roughly 50-50, um, even in my PhD. That, that changed quite a bit when I transitioned into industry. So I, I joined Samson Reuters uh, in 2018 as a data scientist and recently got promoted to a senior data scientist. And when I joined, I was the very first female in a team of six men. Um, and I have to say, it was a little bit odd at the beginning because I just wasn't used to that feeling. Um, but but thankfully, that changed very rapidly. Um, so we hired quite a lot of people. We put a lot of emphasis on diversity hires. And overall, we're now way closer to achieving full gender balance, which, which I'm very happy with. 
And within the labs, we're working with a lot of text data. So I learned natural language processing skills on the job. Again, a lot of experience also working on the cloud. I was able to attend a lot of customer events, workshops, and mentor interns, which I enjoy very much. And most recently, I'm leading a research theme around the topic of human-centric AI. And part of that is the whole aspect of ethical AI, which pl plays a very important role of what we do within Thomson Reuters. So the second part will be around this topic. Um, but first, I really hope that what I showed you on this slide kind of makes you realize that there are quite a lot of relevant skills that you can pick up in academia, which very nicely translates to the needs that are here in industry. And um, so if you think that this is a transition you're interested in, think about those skills and really point them out actively in their job interviews. Um, I think Daniela mentioned it within the labs, we have a very diverse background, bioinformatics, electrical engineering, physics, and so on. So if this is a career you want to be interested in, but you don't have a computer science degree, like you just, just know that you don't necessarily need it. There's many, many different ways to get into a career of data science. Uh, we're moving to the second part, which is on the importance of AI ethics in data science. So a lot of what we do within the labs involves AI, and we put a lot of emphasis on applying AI ethically within Thomson Reuters. Um, and you might have come across this topic in the media in the past. So what I put here on the slide are really just a couple of snippets um, from recent news articles. And if we just look at them overall, there are some common topics around biases. So we see biases in gender, we see racial biases. Another thing that we can see is that this topic really impacts many different domains. So on here, you see examples from healthcare. We have examples from recruitment, education, criminal system. So it really doesn't discriminate. It's, it's, it's all over the place where ethical AI matters. And um, there's also some quite interesting legal issues that seem to be arising. So if you look at the bottom snippets, there is a, there is a, an AI system that made an invention. So essentially, a patent was given to this AI system, which is something that I think hasn't happened before. Um, and then in the, in the upper left corner, it's really the question about what do we do with AI systems that could have quite large scale adverse effects? How do we start regulating those? And that's also why nowadays we're seeing quite a bit of a trend towards creating ethical guidelines, regulations that kind of tell us how to deal with this new technology. And if we can move to the next slide. So I think you've now seen how it is being covered by the media. And I just want to very briefly cover just a, a commonly used definition that we use to describe what AI ethics is, because I feel like everyone has a slightly different definition. And what I want to point out here, and also again, the topic of diversity comes here a lot. It's this is a multidisciplinary field of study. Like it can't just be AI experts that solve these problems. We need many different roles collaborating together. The goal here is that we want to build AI systems that are absolutely aware of our values and implement them in a beneficial way while making sure that we're reducing the risks that just happen to come with AI systems. Um, and the last point, again, stressing that we can't just rely on technical solutions to this. We need non-technical solutions as well. Um, and also here, I think the aspect that Daniela mentioned, the feeling that we, we want to belong and feel comfortable in a group is really important because if we don't feel welcome, included in a group, we might not have the confidence to speak up. And, and I think ethical AI is really important. If you are in a company or, or even in academia and you feel like there is an application of AI that you're not fully comfortable with, you should be able to speak up. And for that, we really require this feeling of, of belonging. And um, then moving on to the next slide, I just want to very briefly highlight that those are kind of the guiding principles we have within Thomson Reuters. I don't have time to go through all of them, but there's kind of core aspects which are common across many different companies, which include aspects of privacy, accountability, justice, fairness, safety, security, and explainability. And this is really very much work in progress within Thomson Reuters, but also globally, you start with those large kind of broad scale principles and you're starting to translate them into what does it actually mean for people who work on it every single day. So this is an active area of research, but I think it's good that our company has put those principles out there. And so we, we are kind of also held accountable towards it. And with that, if we can move to the last a uh, couple of slides. So with, with that in mind, I really want to take a quick look at a typical AI life cycle. 
and think along the way about what are the kind of questions that we are encountering and that we kind of have to ask ourselves to make sure that the AI systems we're building are done so in an ethical or trustworthy way. And um, so for those who are not necessarily aware with this life cycle, the, those are very four rough stages. It starts with the problem definition. Then we are building the system and that includes, we have to obtain the data, define the kind of features that matter and then train our model. Then the next stage would be, we need to evaluate the model. And once we're happy with the model performance, we can of course deploy it. So to make this whole um, principle a bit clearer or more concrete, um, I'm going to do that based on a use case that we have worked on within Thomson Reuters. And this is really, to, we wanna build a system that can automatically summarize US court cases. And those summaries are used to kind of inform our customers about potential business opportunities. And so first stage is the problem definition. You can see our use case on the left-hand side. So at the moment, um, editorial teams are reading summaries, uh, sorry, are reading court cases, very long court cases every single day, and they have to summarize them. And you can imagine that's a very time consuming task and potentially a bit error prone as well sometimes. So what we're thinking here, is there a way for us to support editors in their task by potentially creating a very first version of the summary for them? So this is kind of, this is the problem we have and this is the hypothesis we have. And then on the right hand side, you can see some of the questions that I think we should be asking ourselves at this stage. So you can absolutely use this model also for your use case. So should we even be offering this service? What are the regulatory requirements in this domain? Who is interacting with the system? Who is accountable for wrong model predictions? And so on. Then moving on to the next stage. So once we hopefully decided, yes, this is an appropriate um, application, we can go to building the system on here, I'm just focusing on the data itself. So for our use case, we were quite fortunate. We had 1 million pairs of court documents and associated summaries that were already written by editors. And so that's quite the, and we're, we're quite lucky because we knew that the quality of it is very high because it was created by internal editors. But I think that's really a question you should ask yourselves. And um, what's, what's the quality of it? So if you're just downloading your data set from the internet, Maybe sometimes it's a bit questionable where it came from. Are there any kind of hidden biases that might kind of be potentially exaggerated even by your model? How was the data collected? Does it contain any um, PII, so personally, uh, personally identifiable information that maybe could be detected down the line? So if you don't need it, just remove it. And I think that's always a safe thing to do. And then moving on to the next step, so once we have secured our data and then trained the model with it, we are at the stage of evaluating the system. We usually do that in kind of two ways, the traditional approach, which is let's do statistical measures for summarization. This happens to be a Rouge score. And, but this is very much a proxy metric for how well a summary um, compares to um, a human written summary. So what we usually do is we also perform double blind evaluation studies so we give an, give an editor um, a court document and the summary, and we ask them, do you think the summary is publishable? But the editor doesn't know if the summary was written by a human or generated by a machine. They just ask, do you think it's publishable? And the results are shown on the slide. So on average, the human written summaries are, are slightly better, so they outperform the machine. But we were still quite um, happy with the model's performance and decided, yes, we want to implement it, but with a human in the loop. So the human will always check the output of the model. Again, at this stage, I think I want to stress the importance of not just considering average metrics. If we just consider the average performance of this model across all court cases, we're completely ignoring the variance. We don't know what's the best and worst case experience. Um, and also we want to know how is the user interacting with it. As I mentioned here, we want the user to always look at the model output and not skip one of them. And with that, we can move to the final stage, which is when we're happy with the performance, we can deploy it. And this is just a, an older version of our deployed system. In, in this case, there was the court case PDF on the right-hand side, and we have a, a summary button on the left-hand side. As users push this button, the summary appears. So it's kind of black box. It can't really go that much more black box than what it is currently. And so of course the question comes up, why would the user trust this system? 
you're pushing a button, the summary appears. Is there anything that can help you gain confidence? And that's where the whole topic of explainable AI comes in. And um, if that's a topic that you're interested in, feel free to scan the QR code there and it will bring you to a paper that we recently published on adding explainability to this specific use case. Um, so that's essentially it for my part. I, I hope this brief overview of how I transitioned from academia to industry was helpful and I was able to show you really the importance of designing, developing and deploying ethical AI solutions. And with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Urme. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Danilo and Adya, for your insights. Uh, I'm Urmi Ghosh. I'm a software engineer in machine learning at Thomson Reuters Lab, Zoom. Um, today, I'm going to talk about my career journey. And um, I'm also going to talk about some challenges we face when we move research work into production. So let me start by giving you a bit information about my background. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so growing up in India, um, I wanted to be a software engineer because I like math and the smartest people I knew were in this profession. <laughs> so to pursue my dreams, I took uh, computer science as an elective in my high school itself and eventually did my bachelor's in computer science. Now, it was only during my undergrad years I realized how underrepresented women were in, in college. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was very surprising to me because uh, we girls, we performed so well in high school, but somehow the numbers in college did not reflect that. Uh, because we were so few, often we would find ourselves absent from important conversations, um, missing out informal coding sessions, information about uh, internship and research opportunities and so on. The way I personally dealt with this was to show up at every interesting opportunity and connecting with as many people I could, as I could before, uh, because it wasn't happening organically. So my first job out of college was at American Online, where I worked as a software engineer in a more traditional role. I was uh, responsible for uh, developing APIs for serving ads. During my undergrad years, I was introduced to AIML when I started participating in various shared tasks and workshops for NLP. Now with uh, the latest advances in machine learning, I was very motivated to get formal education in ML. And after about uh, two years in the industry, I decided to pursue my master's in computational linguistics. During my master's, I attended various national and international conferences, and I was able to publish and present my work on dependency parsing. Um, after finishing my master's, I moved to Zurich, and I was looking for a job where I could use my skills both as a software engineer and my skills in machine learning. And I found the perfect opportunity at TR Labs with this role. And um, it's been almost eight months since I started. Uh, now, after witnessing less than 10% representation for women in technical roles, so throughout my college, my first job, to get introduced to TR and see talented women in senior and leadership roles has been an inspiring journey for me so far. Uh, let's move on to the next section of my presentation. So from research to production. Now, there's a shift in mindset as well as priorities when we shift from research to production environments. During research, we tend to focus on the best performing models, um, often based on complex state-of-the-art research. Um, however, in production, a simpler model with good enough performance is preferred due to ease in deployment and maintenance. Uh, click, please. <laughs> so a uh, model with 95% performance metric might be preferred over a model with 97% uh, performance metric. And that is why research and engineering team need to work in unison from the model building stage itself. Uh, now, one of the biggest challenges we face in production is that during research, the model is trained on static data. Uh, but in production, the data is noisy and prone to shifting with time and eventually drifting. Um, click, please. Uh, in other words, machine learning research is about producing a model with high performance on known constraints. Production, on the other hand, is uh, making sure that the model fits into the target product in a reliable fashion. Um, the focus is on 
other aspects like is the inference fast is it reliable is it uh, reproducible is it robust is it easy and quick to update is it easy to integrate is it easy to interpret is it fair now to answer some of these questions we sometimes uh, need to head back into research as uh, nadia previously mentioned about uh, ai ethics and fairness these aspects are extremely important to business and decision making process um, now let's look at the ml model life cycle as a big picture as you can see uh, model building is only the first step in building an ai ml solution uh, delivering ai enabled cap capabilities it's a long path and uh, making it repeatable and sustainable requires strong engineering discipline more so because um, the tooling and services in this space it's still immature and it's evolving at high speed now research and data scientists are mainly re responsible for the model building phase coming up with the best model for our use case their presence um, continues uh, up and after deployment to support the process and ensure that the end results match the expected quality. On the other hand, uh, software engineers in ML are present throughout the pipeline from building to delivering ML part solutions in production. Now for the rest of the talk, I will focus on uh, program reusability uh, as working with a repeatable program uh, for the data preparation and model building phase is the first step to help make the system robust and easy to scale. Uh, next slide, please. OK. So experimental code uh, into production state. So often the first uh, iteration of the experimental code uh, for the by the research team is in a Jupyter notebook. Now, Jupyter notebooks are great in an experimental setup, but is often non-reproducible by other software engineers. Uh, Click, please. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, that exact dependencies are hard to figure out. Another click, click. Um, the, there are parts and parameters that are hard coded. Yeah, more animation to come. Uh, yeah, some uh, states are uh, executed out of order, uh, and that introduces unreliability in your code. Uh, often it's non modular and not tested. Uh, and it's basically, it's very difficult to reproduce. Now you can handle all of this if you convert your notebooks to Python scripts. Uh, next, yeah, this is the slide. Now you can make the code modular so you can reuse chunks of your code and maintain it easily. Uh, parameterizing your code can also help run different configurations of, of your code. Now, adding exact dependencies in a requirements file is going to help replicate the running environment for your code in the, uh, in the project. Now, adding unit tests and proper documentation is also a mandatory software design practice to ensure quality and maintainability. Uh, let's move on to the next step. Uh, ML pipeline orchestration for model release. Now, there is a need to orchestrate workflows across different steps of the machine learning process. So these processes are like pre-processing of the data, training, tuning, evaluating models, and uh, deploying models to production. Now, this space is still very new, and such orchestration is often achieved by manual intervention in many organizations. In real world, models um, often break and require retraining and new experimentation on new data. And deploying an ML pipeline uh, that can automate these steps will help you adapt to rapid changes in data, as well as environment and production. The diagram in this slide, is, it's a sample uh, pipeline for model release. This pipeline run can be initiated on demand. It can be scheduled to run at periodic intervals. And it can even be triggered on data changes. So what do I mean by it? If I introduce a new updated data in the associated storage, the pipeline is going to get triggered automatically. So with pipelining, we can reuse workflows to recreate, optimize models, and register to new versions of the model. And this helps us uh, in scaling ML throughout the organization. 
Now, uh, I hope I could provide you with some insights on uh, machine learning in production. Uh, let's invite Andrea to speak on how AI is transforming DevOps. Thank you. Over to you, Andrea. Yeah, thanks for me. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Yuga, and uh, I am a software engineer at Thomson Reuters Lab since two and a half years ago. I am originally from Romania, and uh, a few years ago, I decided to embark on a journey to the Netherlands. I started my bachelor in 2015 uh, there at Fontys University. At first, I was extremely nervous about going abroad, uh, leaving all the things that I was comfortable with and going to a place I knew no one. But I took this chance uh, to explore and step out of my comfort zone. This decision brought me to the Netherlands, into a different culture with different attitudes and values. And when I was doing my research, I found out that Fontys University offers a wide variety of engineering classes, multicultural environment, and innovating techniques of study. It is true that when I first started, I was the only female in my class. But however, the other classes from the same year were more fortunate with like two to five more females. But since then, I noticed that every year this number keeps increasing. Studying abroad was a huge opportunity for my personal growth and development. It added another level to my college experience, ex uh, enabling me to learn in a new way. Experiencing other cultures around the world broadens your perspective and knowledge base and teaches you to think and live differently. During my uh, stay in the Netherlands, I took all the opportunities that appeared along the way. I started working in the admission office, which led me to meet a lot of new and interesting people around the world. I started my pre-master at, at um, uh, Eindhoven University of Technology, and I applied for a bunch of internships. The first internship I did was a summer internship at Accenture, followed by one at Philips, and uh, followed by another one in 2019 with Thomson Reuters Labs. In, um, at the end of the same year, more specifically in September, when I also obtained my bachelor degree, I've also joined the Thomson Reuters Labs team on a permanent position. What I like about Thomson Reuters Labs is that I have the chance to collaborate with an interdisciplinary and diverse team of industry experts across locations, uh, which in my opinion is an amazing opportunity to grow as a professional. The variety of roles helps bridge any difficulties that a certain team might face. Effectively bringing machine learning to production is one of the biggest challenges that data science team face today. We are delivering AI-enabled capabilities into live products, and there is a strong need to bridge the skills as well as the mindset, differences between engineering team and AI ML research world of data science. The challenge of productionizing ML is real, as Urmi mentioned before. Studies show that 80% of AI projects get stuck in development phase, are partially successful or end up consuming far more time and resources than initially intended. Uh, therefore, deploying AI effectively and at scale requires leveraging agile development practices and scalable solutions to facilitate end-to-end -end collaboration among teams, enable them to work more efficient. In the labs, cloud engineers and software engineers with a specialization in machine learning are a key to our success. Software engineers with an ML specialization represent the transition between data science and software engineering. Our knowledge of software engineering best practices, combined with the knowledge in the AI ML field, allow us to fill the gaps between these two words. Um, can you click, please? Thank you. Um, MLOps has emerged as a category to describe topics about workflow and tooling in machine learning. It's a logical methodology that standardizes and automates data science and machine learning life cycles while enabling seamless collaboration and communication between teams. MLOps aims to reduce the time and difficulty of pushing models into production, enabling knowledge sharing and enhancing collaboration, improving model versioning, monitoring, tracking, and management. Implementing MLOps enables data scientists, machine learning engineers, and DevOps teams to work together and seamlessly scale their processes around model training, data management, and deployment. In my capacity as a software engineer, my work is mostly oriented towards DevOps. Infrastructure as code makes possible to automate infrastructure provisioning and scaling, which accelerates the speed at which cloud applications are developed, deployed, and scaled at a reduced cost. Infrastructure as code relies on machine-readable file definitions that uses coding language to automate infrastructure provisioning. 
And infrastructure as code principle has a lot of benefits. One of which, uh, click please, uh, systems can be easily reproduced. It should be possible to reliably build any element of the infrastructure, meaning that there is no need to make any significant decisions about how to rebuild that element. The ability to build and rebuild any part of the infrastructure is powerful. It removes the risk and fear when making changes. Moreover, processes are also repeatable. Click, please. Thank you. Uh, building on the reproducible principle, any action that you carry on your infrastructure should be repeatable. This is an obvious benefit of using scripts and configuration management tools rather than making changes manually. Uh, click, please. Systems are also consistent. Uh, infrastructure's code must offer consistency, no matter how many times it is executed. Uh, click, please. Systems are also disposable. One of the benefits of dynamic infrastructure is that resources can be easily created, destroyed, replaced, precised, or even removed. In order to take advantage of this, systems should be designed to assume that infrastructure will always be changing. The ability to handle changes gracefully makes it easier to make improvements and fixes on a running infrastructure. It also makes services more tolerant to failure. And the last one, design is always changing. Uh, click, please. Okay. Uh, software infrastructure must be designed as simply as possible to meet the current requirements. The most important measure to ensure that the system can be changed safely and quickly is to make the changes frequently. This forces everyone involved, in, uh, involved to learn uh, good habits for managing changes, to develop efficient, streamlined processes, and to implement tooling uh, doing so. In the labs, we support adoption of infrastructure as code principles by simplifying and promoting reusing uh, and standardization of infrastructure definitions that meet internal rules and standards. Um, in order to do that, we are using uh, AWS Cloud Development Kit. Uh, yeah, that's it from my part. Thanks for listening. And yeah, now we can move to the questions. Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. So um, let's see the, the evolution of more applicants, seeing more applicants is um, there is a shift on the market, more women that uh, feel confident at uh, embracing at, uh, a, te a technology career. Um, on the other side, uh, so we, we have some measures around the way we post our jobs. We also participate uh, to events like these to to make to raise the awareness that hey <laughs> we are here we are open and we are looking for um, talent uh, without um, a gender filter um, and um, there are other techniques um, we are being uh, teached at on how we frame our job postings to uh, use language that um, is um, you know, it's it, it adapt the terminology that we use in our job posting to make it more neutral. Um, often we are told, yeah, if you put work like leadership or um, competition or some, uh, don't ask me why, but apparently, uh, according to psychological studies, um, it, it tends to attract more um, male uh, versus woman and so on. So that's that's things that we, we take care of. Then within the company, we have also a push um, top down um, to increase um, gender diversity, uh, meaning that, yeah, we, we have um, support to sponsor um, organizations like uh, Women Plus Plus and participate into communities um, doing activities within the company and outside of the company to try to promote um, more diversity or gender diversity on the market, knowing that, you know, um, if we are good to the outside, um, it will come back. <laughs> um, you, you can promote as much as you want internally, but, you know, uh, we need to, to hire people. And the only way we can get to more talent is 
by increasing um, the, the, the ratio outside of, of the company. So uh, by school, do you, mean, do you still mean college or uh, my high school? Uh, because in high school, the representation was fairly split. And um, if you see some of the stats in India, some of the toppers and you know the high performers used to be girls. Are, I think it's still girls um, at high school. And I think it also has to do with the stream that I chose. So for computer science, I think somehow women uh, girls were not that attracted to coding and i'm talking about something you know like five like years back right um so the situation itself has improved like like everyone mentioned in this panel that you know it gets better with every year so my seniors were like like amongst my seniors there were even fewer girls i mean hardly any female tas and but with you know coming years and juniors there were more and yeah it was discouraging i mean there were years when i was extremely discouraged and i had an imposter syndrome but i think once you just i i don't know break the glass ceiling or at least your perception of that glass ceiling you you see women in leadership roles like all over it's it's there and um, you just need to you know, push yourself and, and be inspired by, you know, all the positive aspects. And that pushed me, that's my answer. But in, let's say in data science, for, for sure, I think Kaggle competitions are pretty common uh, to get your hands on, get some experience in there. Um, in coding, uh, pure engineering, there are lots of open source projects lo looking for um, volunteers. And you know, you, you can join, right? In, in general, these open source communities are really thankful and open for people to contribute. There are really policies uh, saying, you know, everybody's welcome uh, to contribute. Um, and uh, yeah, if you are learning, it might not be perfect, but you might have people that it's commenting, uh, building constructive, um, as a giving constructive feedback on, on what you code and uh, give you ways on how to improve the way you code and, and, um, and so on. So I think, you know, if these are all possibilities on on how to do things and you know a lot of stuff comes from your personal interest i i started personally i started coding um, well my experience with coding was looking at my brother on a commodore 64 for those who know still what it is uh, just print it writing some statements and of course looking at my brother five years older it was like a child it was wow that's great uh, everything is great what's the older brothers do right but um then over time you know i started coding a bit on my scientific cal calculator and then uh, later on coding some games on uh, on uh, on my computer just trying out things and it's this probably doesn't count a whole lot when you go into a job interview, but I, I tell you, it, it's the fundamental piece, it's the passion, really, the look, look under the hood, just, just don't accept that uh, you read a tutorial and you understand how to use a library. Be curious, go and look what is behind that library, understand what it does. And once you get there, you, you understand the principles behind that library, and that will help you grow and and when you go into a job interview, it will demonstrate that you are not the person that just takes what is there, it's the person that looks under under the hood and understands things, really keen to understand things. And with that mentality, you get everywhere. Thank you to the whole team of Thompson Reuters. It was super interesting to get that insight from the actual life work environment. I appreciate it.